Hi everyone, it's Jerry. If you have an interest in chess, you've likely already heard of the movie titled Queen of Catway. It's a Disney movie set to be released September 30th, 2016. It's based on a true story, one depicting the life of Fiona Mutesi, uh, who today is a Ugandan chess player, a chess champion of Uganda. Uh, I've watched about a 40-minute video, a documentary, about her. Uh, I've seen the trailer to the Disney movie. I've included links to both in the description to this video if you're interested in learning more about her. But just to give you a little bit of insight about her, about her story, um, it's one that'll break your heart, but uh, hopefully uh, inspire. At the age of three, she lost her father. Shortly thereafter, her older sister. And this resulted in her being homeless and having to move to a very poor part of Uganda, namely Katwe. Uh, and it was not long before education was not a priority. Uh, she would go on to quit school in order to focus on more important things like food and water. So for me to just say that Fiona Mutesi is someone who had to endure a lot is just a complete understatement. Um, what I would like to do in this video is, <laughs> on a brighter note, uh, is to see who Fiona Mutesi is over the 64 squares. Uh, she is an active chess player today. She represented her country uh, just recently at the 2016 Women's Olympiad held in Baku. Uh, this was in September of 2016. She played three games. We'll have a look at one of the games right now. In round four, Uganda the women's Ugandan team was paired against Honduras. Fiona Mutesi was playing as white on board four versus Honduras's uh, Maria Prati Ramos Donier. So let's have a look and see uh, Fiona Mutesi, the chess player. E4, E6, the French defense. Knight c3, d5, d3. Bishop is pinning the knight, and white is just maintaining the structure, not allowing any doubled c pawns on this capture. d takes, d takes, and just getting some more pieces out. This is no longer a reliable defender of e4, so the bishop's now there to defend. Knight c6. And after f4, black replies well, challenging the pawn duo. e5 it is. And now we have a bit of a misstep with f5, one that uh, black does not capitalize on. There's a, right out of the opening here, a, let's say, a little back-to-back -back mistake. After f5, black plays for b6, seeing that this isn't such a great diagonal for the bishop anymore. Black is preparing to fianchetto. However, there was one missed opportunity here. There is a little tactic for black, and that is to capture the knight, and then knight takes e4. The idea being that on bishop takes knight, there can now follow queen h4, which picks the bishop up and then some queen takes bishop, and soon another pawn will fall. This isn't the best continuation at this point. Better would be to play queen, queen to g4. But uh, this idea altogether was, I guess, overlooked uh, by both players at this early stage. In the game, it was b6. And now just getting on with some more development. Bishop b7. A question is thrown to the bishop. Bishop d6, castles, queen.
queen d7. We have a pin against the knight, and after queen e2, king b8, a pin against the other knight. h6, bishop back, and this is now a serious blunder by black, playing g5. It's trying to squash this pin, or just resolve the pin against the knight, but... White can capture that pawn, f takes g, and this threat is back on, so maybe the idea by black was to invest some material in order to get some open line against the white king, but this wasn't a good decision. Bishop to e7, and now knight takes e4. White is taking advantage of the fact that the knight is pinned to the queen. Knight takes e. Not necessarily best in the computer's eyes, just grabbing this pawn on f7 is better. But knight takes e4. This move here results in several exchanges. Queen d4 check. Queen f2. It appears that white's going to be losing this knight, so this is something that Fiona needed to calculate here. After knight takes e5, there is this fork against the knight. However, after queen f2, not only is the... Uh, the check blocked on f2 with the queen, but also there's now some pressure against the f6 knight. So the knight on e5 falls, but so too now does the knight on f6. Bishop takes knight, bishop takes bishop, queen takes bishop, and black inserts a check. King hides in the corner. f takes g, queen takes g. The queen is now hit, and queen to e6, so as it stands right now, white is up a couple pawns, but at the same time, black does have some open lines towards the white king. Material isn't always such an important factor in these opposite sides castling type positions. Let's see what black can do with that. In the game, not so much, especially after uh, this next move. Bishop c8, queen c4, we now have a queen exchange. And with that, there is now absolutely no fear of the white king coming under any heavy fire. Bishop takes queen, of course. And, you know, I went through the three games that Fiona Mutesi played at the Olympiad, and I liked this one most for the following reason. Um, as soon as the queens were exchanged in this game, and I was cycling through the moves, I and I do this when I review games, I question, is this something that I would do? Is this how I would convert the position from you know, this moment on? And what I found interesting is that how she played it from this point on is pretty much exactly how I would have played it for whatever that's worth. Um, she, white is up a couple pawns, but uh, the approach taken, one that doesn't allow counterplay, one that restricts uh, the opponent's pieces in a, a good way, um, that's a very good approach. I believe uh, the technique used, let's just say, from this point on by white was good. It was just really good. Rook d4, bishop d3, everything is defended here. It's tough to get active for black. This is this move, rook to d4, it strikes at the bishop, but as soon as bishop d3 is played, everything is just locked together and... The rook, while centralized, is really going nowhere. He's There's nothing along the fourth rank that's so special, and there's no great way to dislodge the bishop from d3. Black realizes this and retreats the rook. What does white do? Activates the rook on the seventh rank. Knight c6. No need to exchange rooks. There isn't a rook playing. Double up. A pair of rooks are exchanged. Knight to e5. 
And this is one of the points I'm getting at, this next move, rook to f6. Many different rook moves you can make. You could say to yourself, well, I'm going to stay on the seventh rank. Quite a popular post for the rook, but I like the move rook to f6. And in fact, in the computer's eyes, this is a top move. Again, white is up a couple pawns, but still finding the best moves here. Rook to f6 is one that I like. Simply maintaining pressure on the h6 pawn. To a certain degree, one may say that, you know what, this is the new 7th rank, so to speak. This is where there is some uh, potential target for the white rook. Knight takes bishop, c takes, of course, h5, and right around this point, I thought to get my king in, I, I thought I would get my king involved, but there is even better, d4, and this addresses any possibility that the black rook may become active. Certainly the rook will not get active, the black rook will not get active along the f-file, nor will it get active along the e-file because the knight guards e4. After the move d4, if the rook comes over here, there's simply d5. This knight shuts down both of these files, the rook has the other one, and as a result, there's no way for this black rook to get activated. So this is a fine move. Instead of typically you want to just get the king involved, and this would be an okay move, but I like this move better, d4 with the idea of d5, and it just squashes any type of counterplay that the rook might even uh, think about. Bishop b7, d5, black is coming over with their king. A little bit of an improvement for the rook now, getting on the 7th. Rook to e8, and now the king is getting involved. Rooks are challenged. There's really not much for black to do around this point. Rooks are exchanged, and white is able to pick up another pawn with knight to b5, forking the a and c pawns. King d7, a pawn drops, the white king continues to improve, and soon... We have this one going right down to a king and pawn ending, where normally you only need one pawn plus for it to be a win, but white now is up three pawns. And this one plays right out to checkmate in just a few more moves right here. Last move being move 54, queen to f6. So... Uh, Again, of the three games, I found this one to be the most interesting, especially as soon as the queens were exchanged. But, I mean, the big thing that uh, I would, I'm would i really wanting to highlight through uh, presenting this game is, you know, I'm, uh, it's my hope here is that uh, I can help spread her story and that this video too can maybe uh, act as some encouragement to the Fiona Mutesis, let's just say, uh, the Fiona Mutesis of the world who may be listening right now. And I'm hopeful you can find the strength to persevere.